And with that, we're gonna uh, kick off our uh, 2023 uh, Lubsky Lecture. And I couldn't be more proud of introducing the speaker who is a mentor and friend of mine, Professor Cynthia uh, Morton, uh, who needs no introduction. She's well known to almost uh, each one of you, uh, but I'll just say a few words and spare the rest of her very long biography uh, so we can enjoy uh, her talk, which I promise is gonna be uh, one to remember. Uh, Professor Morton uh, obtained her PhD in human genetics from the Medical College uh, of Virginia. She then did her postdoc uh, at Harvard uh, with um, David Kernett and Phil Leder, and she remained at Harvard uh, since. She is currently the um, William Lambert Richardson Professor of OBGYN and Reproductive Biology and Professor of Pathology at Harvard Medical School. She's also the Kenneth Ryan Distinguished Chair in OBGYN, the Director of Cytogenetics and Past Director of the Biomedical Research Institute at the Brigham Women's Hospital. Um, she is triple board certified from the American uh, Board of Medical Genetics and Genomics in PhD medical genetics, clinical cytogenetics, and clinical molecular genetics. Um, she has more than 325 original articles. I think uh, the folks here in the UK were thrilled when she uh, became the chair in auditory genetics at, uh, at the University of uh, Manchester a few years ago, and she still uh, is uh, the, the, the chair there. Um, and on, uh, in addition to her um, uh, Harvard um, uh, uh, post. She is well known to us in many capacities. I think uh, most of us remember uh, fondly when she was the uh, uh, president of the American Society of Human Genetics, and many of us probably interacted with her when she was the editor of the American Journal of Human Genetics for six years, and she was the a uh, rare breed of editors who would still make you feel good about yourself even when your paper is rejected, so we much appreciate it. Um, so um, I can go on and on to describe uh, many of her awards. I, I think she is most proud of uh, the prestigious uh, Distinguished Cytogeneticist Award from the American Cytogenetics uh, Conference. So I will keep it short, um, and I will now pass it on to Professor Morton to tell us about uh, how to explore the non-coding genome using structural rearrangements of chromosomes. So Cynthia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. And, uh, I'm honored, really honored to be here and honored to be the Lowski lecturer. Um, Jim, if you're there listening, you have been a role model for us in terms of understanding structural rearrangements and genomic rearrangements and um, giving us insight into various uh, disorders. So um, I wish you were here with us. Um, we'll be thinking about you, though, today. So um, I'm going to talk with you about an area that I wasn't actually thinking about getting involved in, but um, it turns out that often a particular patient or case will take you to an interesting place. And um, just to give you an overview, I'm going to talk about a, a brief historical perspective on clinical cytogenetics then chromatin organization and human disorders through the perspective of constitutional apparently balanced chromosome rearrangements, then ask the question, what role do links, link RNAs, play in diagnoses of the undiagnosed with rare diseases? And then talk about structural rearrangements in non-coding regions how can cytogeneticists contribute to their interpretations? So this is just an overview of um, where cytogenetics has come from and where it is now. Uh, in the 50s and 60s, there were, they were happy then, I guess, to um, even have unbanded karyotypes. And this allows me 
to say on some bad days in the cytogenetics lab that um, I had the opportunity to look at the original genome scan. Um, then, thank goodness, banding came along in the 70s, and we were able to uh, have a resolution of around 5 to 10 megabases. And then FISH entered um, the scene in the 80s and 90s, and that gave, took us down to the 1 megabase to the gene level. Chromosome microarray analysis was a major change, and that actually allowed, depending on the platform and the laboratory cutoffs in around the 2000 to about 100, and 100 KB. And then where we are now, next generation sequencing and genome annotation. And this gives us base pair level resolution, which enables interpretation with 3D genome information. I think this is our James Webb telescope view. So about two uh, decades ago, I uh, developed a project with some investigators at, at Harvard Medical School, which we fondly called DGAP for Developmental Genome Anatomy Project. And the hypothesis of DGAP is one that's well known, that chromosomal rearrangements in individuals with congenital anomalies can be etiologic in the abnormal phenotype due to disruption or dysregulation of genes critical in human development. And for sure, this is, was sort of the beginnings um, at that time of, um, of uh, positional cloning efforts that were, were really um, amazing in terms of letting us pinpoint genes that were involved in def different phenotypes. So um, this was the study design of DGAP. We were really fortunate to have lots of cell lines and blood samples sent in from uh, various clinical geneticists, genetic counselors, all, all that came from around the world. And then we, so we started with an abnormal karyotype, and we used a jumping library method to identify the rearrangement breakpoints, and then did Sanger sequencing. It was, it was actually a pretty large effort to get through that at, at that early, in those early days. But then we um, were able to identify candidate genes and then validate the breakpoint and the candidate gene in the individual's phenotype starting out with choosing which uh, mouse model we would make of, of different uh, particular rearrangements, and then basically moved on to just database mining uh, for gene function because the sequencing moved to next generation sequencing, and, and, the, and there was a whole game changer. So the initial approach was uh, mate pair sequencing of breakpoints, and then what we were looking for were the uh, reads where there were two ends of a clone that actually didn't belong in the reference genome with each other. So either there, there could be an inversion and they would be on the same chromosome but not, um, co not aligned correctly, or as you see in this slide, two uh, ends of the chromosome indicated just as chromosome A and chromosome B, and then we went to Sanger sequencing in order to define the breakpoints. So why is the 3D genome important for diagnostics in clinical cytogenetics? And I, I remember very well my introduction to this was at the European Society of Human Genetics meeting in Glasgow. Um, and I was listening to a talk from the, the Stefan Mundlos lab, and that's where I thought, I, I need to go home right now because I need to, like, get back in the lab and, and look at all of these chromosome rearrangements that we have, and maybe this will actually shed some light into what we're doing. So this is all based on the fact that humans have a highly organized 3D genome. And it wasn't surprising. In fact, a lot of things in biology are so satisfying that you, you feel like they're not surprising. But um, in this case, it had been known for a while that chromosomes occupied various uh, neighborhoods 
in, in the cell, and it was like important who's in your neighborhood. And so there were, there were also the separation of actively um, transcribed regions and then heter heterochromatic regions, so A and B compartments. And then TADs were described, the topologically associating domains, and within them, sub-TADs. So you see this uh, uh, nice triangle um, that's drawn from uh, some amazing high C analyses. And then going further and further um, into a higher resolution uh, picture, you can see that then looking at chromatin loops where within these TADs, uh, sequences that, that, that affected transcription of, um, of genes were brought close to that gene. So th this was really a, a, an aha moment, I think, for us in biology. And then um, this was a, is a, a drawing from uh, Dariana, Dario Lupianis's paper working in Stefan Mondos's lab. And this shows just the schematic of what's going on, that there are these regions of um, transcriptional uh, talking to each other in terms of an enhancer, such as in the TAD-A diagram, impacting the expression of gene one. But because there's a boundary region between the two TADs, the gene two is not expressed and not impacted by um, the enhancer that's in TAD A. But if something happens like a chromosomal inversion, as the schematic in the um, right below that, you'll see that this region uh, that it, it includes the boundary region gets flipped around, and that enhancer now is possibly going to interact with gene two and turn on its expression, but gene one is, is not expressed. And so you can imagine that the various other scenarios, depending upon what the chromosome uh, abnormality is. And then, uh, of course, if there was a deletion that was in between the boundary region and a gene, there could be no impact from that as well. So this was the, the sort of rules of the game um, that we started reanalyzing many of our cases. And I'm really happy that I um, opened this issue of Science last fall and saw that there was a paper called Replication Timing Regulates Translocation Biogenesis. And it was my uh, great privilege to be a postdoctoral fellow in Phil Leader's lab. And in this time frame, I did a lot of audio radiographic uh, chromosomal insight to hybridization, so a lot of hours in the dark room. Um, and you can see here that we, well, we mapped with, and published both the localization of immunoglobulin heavy chain gene and, and MYC. But there was always this sort of question um, that needed some answer uh, was why? Why did MYC and immunoglobulin become involved in a translocation? And it's, it goes back to the fact that their TADs are actually localized um, near each other in a, uh, in a hub, which includes the factors for uh, replication, so these replication loops. And immunoglobulin actually has as a part of its maturation of antibodies, the, the initiation of double-stranded breaks, and some types of uh, uh, breaks in MYC would actually go with the immunoglobulin, be dysregulated, and cause the lymphoma, Burkitt lymphoma. So that was a really, really exciting time of, of life in the lab. And Again, it's something that is so satisfying when you have an explanation of this that you feel like you knew the answer before you even heard how, how it happened. So I'm gonna um, take you through a couple of my uh, DGAP cases that are, are special cases to me. And this is one which is known as DGAP 103. This is an individual who has a de novo inversion of chromosome 12. This is a 
pericentric inversion, so there's a, a flip around the centromere. And from an early age, it was really noticed by his parents that he had an overgrowth syndrome in addition to facial dysmorphism, which I'll show you a photograph. Um, he was, at age four, the height of an eight-year-old, and he, at, at four months of age, had all of his baby teeth. So there was a really rapid increased rate of growth. He also had um, advanced bone age in, in, in addition to dental age and bilateral bowing of the legs. And then two findings, multiple lipomas and arthritis, which none of, neither one of those would you suspect in an eight and a half year old when he was referred to um, our DGAP project. But um, I was very familiar with the breakpoint on the long arm of chromosome 12 because this is, this is the um, place where there's a gene known as HMGA2, high mobility group protein A2. Um, and this is involved in uterine fibroids, is dysregulated in uterine fibroids, and that was another, has, has been another um, of my research interests. Um, and interestingly, lipomas, also a mesenchymal tumor, have characteristic rearrangements in the large three, um, third intron in uh, HMGA2 that, is, that are consistent. Um, and uh, it turns out that fibroids rarely break the gene. So there's some little question there, actually, that I should try to figure out at some point. Um, so uh, then there's this interesting question, which, frankly, to be honest, we, we didn't think about. And that's why there was brachydactyly of the hands and feet in the presence of this huge overgrowth, long bone overgrowth um, disorder. So I have to show you one karyotype, right? <laughs> or one, one metaphase. And this was actually, I'd say, a day that the genome became smaller because since we were working on HMGA2, I already had the backs that, that flanked the, the gene. And so it just took one experiment to show that we had uh, broken one, uh, bro broken the two uh, backs that were together, as you see on the normal 12, so you see a yellowish uh, um, uh, signal from that, and in the inversion 12, you separate the, the red and the green signals. So here's a picture of the um, DGAP-103 when he's about eight years old. And I think you'll agree that he has facial dysmorphism. Um, also, you'll see that he has brachydactyly. So the, the fingers you're seeing, um, that, that he has these short digits. And then the, the histopathology documenting the, the, that the tumors that were seen on his legs were uh, lipomas. Challenged ourselves always to do is to be able to correlate the clinical findings um, with the, what the role of that gene was, HMGA2. And there were papers that described two mouse models that had HMGA2 truncation. And again, this was a tr truncation in the lipomas in the, in the third, large third intron. HMGA2 is a small protein, only 109 amino acids. Um, then there, were, there were, was a report, at least one, of HMGA2 rearranged in synovia of, of patients with osteoarthritis. And then coming along later um, were, were reports of uh, association studies in, in adults and then in children in, in tall, short case control study that indicated that a SNP in HMGA2 or or the, in three prime region explained about 0.3% of population variation in height, which was a big finding at that point. Now, I, I don't know where it stands with respect to whether it's is, is still such a, a, an important finding. But there's no doubt this single patient, this N of one patient, told us that this gene had something to do with height. So HMGA2 disruption, is there more to this story? 
and what role might link RNAs play in the DGAP-103 phenotype. So the non-coding gene is 90% of the genome does not code for proteins. So it's an amazing part of our genomic space that has the potential for identifying new disease mechanisms, biomarkers and drug targets, and enabling new therapeutic options. And as you can see from this um, little schematic, uh, that the, and the human is indicated in blue and the mouse in gray, that we, we have about 20,000 uh, protein coding genes, and the link RNA count at the time that this diagram was put together uh, showed 16, over 16,000 uh, link RNAs in humans and around 10,000 in the mouse. And what I can tell you is that this is an evolving landscape, and for sure you may look up a gene protein coding gene that you're interested in and you don't see a link perhaps in, in the um, mouse genome and you look at the human genome and it has a link. It's just incomplete annotation at this point in terms of these genes. So we have basically a whole new level of discovery that we need to do and evaluation of gene regulation from these link RNAs. And Amazingly, I mean, the literature is really rich now with telling us about long non-coding RNAs. And this is a paper that was published just January 3rd of this year on definitions, functions, challenges, and recommendations. And I, I can't um, recommend it more highly. It's, it's fabulous. We're, we're sort of all into actually nomenclature and rules and, and so this is a paper that's addressing that, and, and I'll tell you that the, the, these folks did a, an amazing job putting this information together. So this consensus statement actually uh, goes through um, a number of, of these topics that you can imagine would be in there, definition and nomenclature of link RNAs, conservation of link RNAs, they're generally not all that well conserved, expression, so there's really a very uh, specific expression and they are important in development. You can actually look at a series of them through the mouse genome and you'll know some of these genes, although they might, might have uh, different designations. Um, then there are, the paper deals with biological functions of link RNAs, including control of chromatin architecture, enhancer action, formation of biomolecular condensates, and then on a section on link structure function relationships. I, I think they do everything. I mean, it's really amazing um, how, how much they're involved across all of these features of, of biology. So I'm going to just go through a few things with them um, to show you where things stand. So, the definition of link RNAs by this consensus document is actually suggested for the, uh, these non-coding RNAs be, that there are three categories, ones that are less than 50 nucleotides in size, then ones that are in the range of 50 to 500 nucleotides, and then link RNAs, and these are greater than 500 nucleotides in general. Um, and mostly are generated by Paul II transcripts. So others are use Paul three, or there are some that that overlap with Paul five and and Paul two transcripts. So, like I said, they they do everything and they're involved in everything. Is what is is what I feel like in trying to give you this presentation. So. We're going to spend time talking about this group, the category that are greater, around greater than 500 nucleotides. The other things that this consensus statement um, does, it tells you that many are spliced and polyadenylated, but others are not. They can be intergenic, antisense, or intronic. They can be derived from pseudogenes. 
they may include circular RNAs, and they may be transacting regulatory RNAs conventionally acting as the three prime untranslated region, regions of mRNAs. With regard to nomenclature, the classification by Hugo, human gene nomenclature, and GenCode consortium is predominantly based on their genomic position and orientation relative to protein coding genes. And that provides context to regulating the expression of these genes. So if we look at some of the um, visible phenotypes of mutations in long non-coding RNA genes in mice, you'll see, of course, exist. We've known about exist for a long time. This is a link RNA. And then may maybe you will recognize some of these other terms uh, from different studies in, in the mouse. But this actually makes it really visible to you that you need to have a, a very friendly nomenclature in order to see these things when you're in the looking in the browser because with lots of sort of um, AK506 or something, these names that don't mean anything really right off the top of the, your visualization of that part of the um, browser really helps if they have a friendly designation. So um, this is from the, the summary of um, the role, about the roles of link RNAs um, and how they function in dynamic assemblies. It comes from the, the, the uh, consortium or the, the consensus statement paper that these will provide a more comprehensive understanding of cell and developmental biology and of gene environment interactions. Another, summer, another, I think, important sentence from this is that emerging, for this group especially, um, emerging challenges include understanding the roles of link RNAs and RNA modifications in functional plasticity, especially in the brain and the dysregulation of these link-mediated pathways in neurological disorders, cancer, and other diseases. And recently, uh, we did have one link RNA that we published many years ago, um, and it actually is not in, it's not this category that we're gonna spend time on talking uh, about, but I had a phone call from uh, a neurologist at Children's Hospital, and when I, I told her that I, I can't tell her what the significance is of a single nucleotide change in, in a link RNA, and after we talked about it, she's like, we're starting all over again. Well, in, in some ways, we, we are, but l let's think about how we could actually take, take on that challenge. So this is an amazing paper also um, called Divergent Link RNAs Regulate Gene Expression and Lineage Differentiation in Pluripotent Cells. And this actually tells us that uh, the the ma a major class of, of link RNAs and 20% are of a class that we'll call divergent transcripts um, are arranged divergently to nearby genes play a role in transcriptional regulation to fine-tune gene expression and lineage uh, differentiation. So you can see in this figure that we have the link RNA juxtaposed with the coding gene, and the coding gene is in an opposite uh, orientation for, for direction. And the link RNA is, tr is transcribed and then and, and then interacts with, with the, uh, the protein coding gene. And that is very critical in development or other biological processes. How, how did, like, I live without these things before this time? I mean, I don't know that we just didn't see them, and I think that's in, in part because of nomenclature, like making it easy to see where they are. 
So probably you should all go look up your favorite gene and see if you see um, any of these, these particular uh, uses of nomenclature. So this is, I'm gonna tell you a few sort of rules from um, this paper. So the link RNA locus classification reveals non-random genomic distribution relative to protein coding loci. So if you look in the figure on, on the uh, right, you, you'll see that the, the number one, um, this is the, the, shows that the link RNA is actually highly uh, correlated to the location of the protein coding, coding gene that it's regulating. And the protein coding genes are, are not similarly um, organized. They have a, they, and this is from the standpoint of an expression correlation between the link RNA and the protein coding gene. So it's the, the closest positioned gene uh, then with other distal nearby genes. So it's quite, uh, quite striking. Then another um, thing, or sort of rule of the road, was that if within a 5 kb distance, the proportion of protein coding genes observed to a neighbor, to a neighbor, a link rather than a coding gene, is much higher than expected from a random distribution. So you can see where this uh, 5 kb uh, region is indicated, and you see the expected and then what the observed is for the link RNA and the protein coding. They are pairs, and they are really sweet to find. <laughs> um, so that has actually evolved into looking at these links and classifying them into six biotypes. So the two that I'm going to really talk to you more about are the First one on the list under genic, genic link RNA is the one that's the divergent transcript, and 20% of all the, these links are divergent. So you see the head-to-head -head orientation uh, in the in um, sorry about this in this particular one in one. So they uh, they, they comprise actually 19 to 27% of this this group. And then um, there is a tail-to-tail -tail orientation. There's anti-sense in, oh, why am I, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> anti-sense inside. So this link is wholly within the protein coding gene. There, here's anti-sense outside. Um, it's, it's spanning the uh, protein coding gene sense downstream, sense upstream. And then this is the group of the intergenic links. Uh, so we're basically going to just think about these group, and, and they're a big group all, all by themselves. So how might we use cytogenetic rearrangements to interpret variants in link RNAs that are etiologic in clinical phenotypes? So I'm going to return to DGAP 103, and this is the... Um, orientation. So HMGA2 is a large gene genomic-wise, but a small uh, protein. And right here underneath it, I was like, wow, there's the antisense RNA. It's, it's actually totally, uh, wholly within the, the genomic size fragment that HMGA2 occupies. And this, this gold bar, is the place where the breakpoint occurs in the inverted 12. So HMGA2 is disrupted in intron 3 by inversion 12, and that's where the breakpoints occur in intron 12 in lip in, in, sorry, in intron 3 in lipomas. So the the link RNA is really wholly in this intron. And it's three prime to the breakpoint, the chromosomal breakpoint that, that we knew for quite some time. So it, it is one of the antisense inside link RNAs. 
So you see here, I put these little arrows for, for this, the direct orientation of transcription. So this is uh, the HMGA2 on the uh, positive strand and the HMGA-S1 on the negative strand. So what about the brachydactyly? So while I was the editor of the American Journal of Human Genetics, a paper from Stefan Mungo's lab ended up on my um, desk one day. And it turns out that there were, they were reporting deletion and point mutations in a gene called parathyroid hormone-like hormone at 12P11 that were etiologic and isolated brachydactyly. I knew what the closest gene was to the breakpoint in, in, in our uh, inversion, and that's what it was. It was this parathyroid hormone-like hormone gene, and we had tried to do some five prime race to actually look for some type of fusion transcript and didn't find that. So it is located 774 kb telomeric to this uh, breakpoint. So here's a parathyroid hormone-like hormone. And again, no fusion transcript, and it's located within the TAD with the, the breakpoint. So this is the TAD that includes parathyroid hormone-like hormone. Here's the breakpoint. This was the only gene in an approximately four megabase region when I, when I looked it up quickly on Decipher to see what was the story here. Um, it was around a breakpoint uh, predicted to have a gene dosage mechanism, and it was the only gene predicted there to have a gene dosage mechanism. Um, I don't know if it's still that way today, but um, certainly that was what was the, the uh, initial finding. So now we can create the stick figure, if you like, of what's going on in this in, uh, chromosome inversion. So the HMGA2 exons one to three are now on the reverse strand upstream of parathyroid hormone-like hormone. And interestingly, in thinking about HMGA2, the prevailing thought was that the, the first three exons of this gene are AT hook binding uh, DNA domains. And that when they bind, they provide accessibility to transcription factors. So might the fact that the antisense transcript that the, from the link RNA would provide some regulation of, to that where those AT hook domains sat down and, and bound and, and regulated the gene. That would be a reasonable hypothesis given the really indiscriminate apparent binding of, of this five prime region um, that resulted in all these, this overgrowth. But this is more complex than just overgrowth because the parathyroid hormone-like hormone uh, phenotype from brachydactyly, I think is really more attributed to a loss of function. So if this breakpoint um, is, is where HMGA2, uh, the five prime AT hook domains become uh, rearranged, then I don't know at this point what happens to sort of cause a loss of function for parathyroid hormone like hormone as predicted by the manuscript from the Munlos uh, laboratory. So I'm, I have not yet seen a, a link RNA at, at, at this site that might, might shed some light on this or, or know what exactly might be happening at that uh, breakpoint, which again is the right here where the gold bar is. But I think these are things that we now need to really look for. Now, the next case I'm gonna tell you is really the poster child case of this whole expedition. Um, this is, this case designated DGAP 353. There was a mother who had an amniocentesis and the daughter is graduated from college about two years ago, I think now. So it wasn't really in the dark ages. Um, she had an amnio and she was uh, positive for a maternal serum screen for Down syndrome. So the daughter was identified um, from the amniocentesis to have this uh, 1417 rearrangement was 
maternally inherited. And interestingly, the um, daughter developed mild to moderate sensorineural hearing loss at about 10 years of age, and the mother had begun wearing hearing aids at about 40 years of age. But she reported gradual decline in hearing for an unspecified period. So both were basically um, otherwise healthy, consistent with basically what would be a non-syndromic hearing loss. Um, and we began to actually try to think about, OK, the, what, what gene is in this place that, that could explain this? And when I first started working on this case, <clears throat> with Dr. al Kiraya's son, Ibrahim, in my lab for this summer, um, we, we uh, really were sort of not in a gene, but then we, he, I think he found this report in the literature where there was a copy number variant that encompassed TBX2, at the chromosome 17, broke, including the chromosome 17 breakpoint region. And this patient had hearing loss among other clinical findings, but it was a, a, a large segment of um, DNA. Then, um, while time passed, last summer, um, a paper came out in Nature, TBX2, and this was the gene um, that we were, we were following here from, from this report, is a master regulator of inner hair cell versus outer hair, hair cell fate. Wow. That has to be related to this um, in some way. And then subsequent to that, um, genome annotation revealed the breakpoint to reside in something that hadn't been on that genome browser um, air, uh, diagram at the, that point is the TBX2 antisense 1. So this is located on a negative strand, 290 base pairs upstream of TBX2. So we have a separation, not a, an overlap, but a little, a little separation, 290 base pairs, on the positive strand that constituted a divergent link RNA. And this is just the pedigree. There's no, there, was, there was really nothing significant in the um, pedigree. Uh, and Actually, I forgot to point this out. We also did exome analysis, <clears throat> excuse me, without pathogenic, any pathogenic variant being detected in, in a hearing loss gene. So I'll just tell you, uh, this was a beautiful paper that came out last summer that identified TBX2 in the mouse as a master regulator of inner hair cell versus outer hair cell differentiation. So if you start out with an embryonic um, inner hair cell and ablate TBX2, you turn all the, inner, the single row of inner hair cells to another row of outer hair cells. So also, if you um, actually do provide a topic expression of TBX2 into outer hair cells, then they trans, have tan, trans differentiation and transdifferentiation into an inner hair cell. So TBX2 is both necessary and sufficient to make inner hair cells distinct from outer hair cells and maintain this difference throughout development. So we're seeing a gene that actually really is um, akin to the role of these divergent link RNAs in, in um, uh, development. Then you can see here, here's the TBX2 uh, gene going this way um, on the uh, positive strand. And here's this little, little transcript, TBX2 antisense 1. And I think there's sort of, there, there's definitely the, the TBX2, the antisense transcripts are definitely, definitely, generally much smaller than the protein coding gene. So uh, the, and the TBX2 has seven exons. The TBX2 antisense one has um, three exons. So they were, it was a good candidate for um, thinking about this role of links. And here's actually just a, a, a little bit better way to see this. Um, so here's the TBX2 uh, protein coding gene, and here's the TBX2 antisense 
uh, coding gene, and the breakpoint is somewhere right around uh, the end of the gene. So how might we use cytogenetic rearrangements to interpret variants in link RNAs that are etiologic and clinical phenotypes? So this has made me think of a number of things. Might structural rearrangements in the non-coding genome provide some insight into the dysregulation of protein coding genes? Should diagnostic panels of protein coding genes for various phenotypes, such as hearing, intellectual disability, et cetera, should they include link RNAs? Would the solved rate of previously undiagnosed disorders be improved by considering link RNAs as etiologies? Could protein coding genes near to GWAS hits, and I published a few of these papers where on the right-hand side we have a list of all the protein coding genes, but is that no longer the only focus for the underlying genomic variant, and it could, could it be a single change, nucleotide change in the uh, link RNA that's, that's near one of those protein coding variants? So the non-coding genome is a challenge. Again, we're looking at over 16,000 of those, but there are estimates of up to 100,000. Um, and not translated into functional proteins is really tough for us because that's how we interpreted um, the sequence. So the structure, as I've mentioned, typically contains a smaller open reading frame than protein coding genes. Epigenetic mod and modification of cell and tissue specific expression is primarily in the nucleus. Um, and the tissue specific expression also makes it hard because I probably need the cochleus from this mother and her daughter <laughs> um, in order to do the experiment I might like to do. I'm just teasing, obviously. Um, there's a relatively low degree of, of evolutionary conservation, so if you lined up the sequences, you would, you would not find a single uh, place that has, has a change like, like there's, there's just, we've known this for quite a long time. Um, so there's significance to their genomic position, their primary sequence and their secondary structure. They can interact with DNA, RNA, and proteins. Like I said, they do everything and exert functions both in cyst and in trans. They're correlated between levels of expression and developmental processes, or alternatively, with disease states and pathologies. I don't know whether we will actually be able to take um, machine learning or, or artificial intelligence to help us identify causal links and pathways but it didn't escape my attention that during one of the Molecular and Population Genetics Broad seminars that a speaker from DeepMind had interpretation of the link RNAs on the list of things that they were working on. So I'm just going to show you a few more cases um, quickly, just the, the, that will break up into categories of the breakpoint disrupts a gene. And that's a position for a potential position effect of the link RNA on HMGA2 as an example. And in this case, potential loss of function of, of, the, of another gene, like thyroid hormone-like hormone from, a, from an inversion. Or the breakpoint disrupts a link. And that's for potential dysregulation of the protein coding gene resulting in a loss of function. So, I started backwards from the cases that we really have not solved yet, and it was amazing how quickly there were uh, examples of, of the presence of these antisense or divergent transcripts. Well, a lot of these genes are developmental genes, actually, undoubtedly, because these are individuals who have developmental disorders. So here you see, here's uh, DOC1. This is a big gene coming along here in the antisense uh, direction, and here's the link RNA, which, which is in the, the sense direction. So this is the gene dedicator of cytokinesis for. 
Here's another one. This is the gene UBE2E2. And you can see that the breakpoint occurs here in the protein coding gene. And here's the divergent transcript. So see, you'll even see some uh, little, uh, you know, flexible naming in terms of the nomenclature. So this is just this is using in the in the browser DT instead of AS1. Okay, and here's another one. Um, this is the gene. MAT C1, MET transcriptional regulator. Maybe one of these will be the favorite gene of somebody here. It will be great. <laughs> um, and you can see here that there are two uh, uh, link RNAs in, for this gene. One is here in the, this would be the uh, five prime region of that. And this here is the, the um, one. So you have them on, on both uh, in, in to wholly uh, oh, actually, sorry. Th th this one, we think the, the, the divergent transcript is broken. So this is disrupting the link RNA. And then here's another, another link. So for a while, I've been saying it's a time to sequence in clinical cytogenetics, but that's not, new. That's not anything new. Um, but the technical, technological developments have really dramatically accelerated discovery and characterization of structural variants and the knowledge of the 3D nature of chromatin folding. So integration of all of these layers of information is crucial to interpret the pathogenic potential of structural rearrangements. So what role can cytogenesis contribute to interpretation of link RNAs and to diagnoses underlying phenotypes in link RNAs? So I would say, as a community of cytogeneticists, we have an opportunity once again to step forward from the original genome scan. So let's take this opportunity um, with our knowledge of structural rearrangements to serve individuals who seek our insight into their biology and future therapies, because there's a family behind all of these. And I think that's really something that we, we need to remember. So I'll just finish by thanking the, uh, always, the DGAP participants and their families, clinical geneticists, genetic counselors, and cytogeneticists who referred DGAP participants from around the world, and members of the laboratories of the Harvard DGAP investigators, especially Ibrahim Alkiraya, Abna Aegis, Katerina Nalbandian, Raul Pina Aguilar, and Gila Romi, and of other Harvard faculty, especially Elijah Mena and Rebecca Anderson. And Becky's actually spearheading a special issue in human genetics on link RNAs, and she works in Chris Walsh's lab. Um, then members of the laboratory of, of Richard Choi at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, especially Elvis Dong and Matthew Chow. And then I am thankful to the NIH for funding um, for DGAP. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cynthia. Jim sends his regards. He couldn't be more proud of you representing him in the Lovsky lecture. That was just awesome. I guess the question on everyone's mind is, are we not finding Mendelian cases you know, uh, due to link RNA because they just don't exist or because we're not looking for them? And from the preliminary data you have based on DGAP, you know, where you have a large number of groups, a uh, large number of patients with very few where you have direct disruption. And from our positional mapping data, it seems to be the latter, uh, the former. They seem to contribute a small percentage to Mendelian disorders. May I have your take on this while we're waiting for questions? Well, actually, there are um, collections of, you know, cytogenetic rearrangements that could be explored to actually, let's just, let's go for what we can actually understand today. So if we find that we can, we've disrupted a gene by a balanced rearrangement, that, that or the link RNA, I think become the 800 pound gorilla in the room um, in terms of looking for the etiology of it being a diagnosis for a family. Um, so I, I don't know how to solve the single nucleotide changes, because certainly they'll be there, um, and how do, we, how do we interpret those? And like I said, it's not simple, because um, 
they're highly regulated. Um, they're developmentally, you know, in a, in a developmental uh, process. And they're, the tools that we've used in our genetics toolkit, like conservation, are apparently not going to be helpful because they're not well conserved at, the, that, at that level. But their expression probably, it, there, there is some overlap that's, that's possible. So I, I couldn't be more excited for that this would evolve maybe into something that actually helps us really understand how these pieces of our genome actually regulate the, the protein coding genes. And I sometimes thought, this is like having an orchestra when everybody's there, but the conductor doesn't show up. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how it's, it it's, needs to be properly regulated. Yep, much to think about. So let me uh, start with uh, Peter, the microphone runner. Could you please pass on the mic? Is there? Because we really need the mic for the uh, virtual attendees to access the audio, please. Thank you, Cynthia, fantastic lecture. Um, I have one question. So let's say one wanted to do a computational screen for link RNA mutations of this sort. It, what kind of signature do you think we're looking for? So for example, I think, I know, I know you worked on uh, the signature of disrupting TAD boundaries, and, and that's something that you could grasp computationally. But I wasn't so sure here, because for instance, some of these deletions also would have other effects on, let's say, the promoter activation of a gene. So what, what are we actually looking for computationally? Well, I, I would say, you know, the, with this number of between 16,000 to 100,000, let's just get some of them, you know, as, as fast as we can. And um, I think this correlation of expression, so we're going to have to maybe take advantage of organoids or things like that to, to actually specifically look for this correlated expression pattern between the two of them. But I'm really all ears to hear what people think about, you know, trying to solve this problem because for sure we, we need to be able to do that. And, and, and believe me, you can, you can look, you know, from one day to the next to see what turns up on the genome browser and what gets annotated that wasn't there previously, and you'll, you'll find something. So don't think that the fact that you don't see it means that it's not there. It's just not annotated, and a lot of them, not, a lot of the annotations have come from um, RNA-seq and, and um, single-cell-seq for, for really trying to figure this out. So I don't have a good answer for that, but I'm really willing to at least take what I feel like we can grab a hold of already. Wonderful. Uh, we have a bunch of questions online, so Jen, if you could please can post one or two. We do. Um, so I'll, I'll choose a medium-sized one first, which is, wouldn't integration of RNA sequencing after an initial non-diagnostic investigation have helped for at least some of these cases? Seems likely, as long as the, the, that we recognize that what that is, you know. but. Yeah, but I, I think that's the case. I mean, yeah. And another, I think, fairly short uh, question. There was interest in your patient, DGAP-103, whether there were features consistent with Russell Silver syndrome, given the association of HMGA2 with Russell Silver syndrome. In particular, the brachydactyly, which is seen with RSS, was mentioned. Um, I, I think we've had this discussion yeah. at, at some point, and I, I, I don't think we feel that that's um, appropriate. Actually, I think I had this with, with Ibrahim even, I exactly. So, yeah, we don't think so. Terrific. Anna, did you have a question? Can I yeah, have the mic? Yeah, I just yeah. was fascinating. Uh, just if you please wait for the mic. Oh, actually, you do have a mic. Yeah, I apologize. Please, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I think so. so. Thank you so much for a brilliant talk. Um, so, obviously, a lot of the focus right now is on the unsolved cases. but. Could we also sort of have another look at our solved cases? I'm yeah, thinking that's we have what we're all doing. Of these kind of publications with expansion of the phenotype, and then we have these sort of domain-specific phenotypes, etc. Looking at proteins, could those actually be because we're overlapping with one of these inside the gene? I'm expecting you to do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, tr truly, I mean, I, I think that 
it, it may be ones that at first glance you think, well, you know, this was a pretty good guess, but it really didn't fit that well. Maybe, maybe it's because there's actually, it, it is either a complex disorder like DGAP-103 um, or it it's just was wrong. Um, and, and there's a better, you know, so it, I guess what I feel that would really be helpful if somebody would just do a scan and put together all the um, pairs so that we know what the list is. I mean, this can't be that hard, right? I mean, and, and then we can use that as a screen um, for potential etiologic link RNAs and their protein coding gene as a pair. So we have uh, uh, time for one last quick question. If you please pass it on to the gentleman in the back. Hi, so simple question. In your family associated with uh, TBX2, the deaf family, was the mother a somatic mosaic for the variant? She was a bit milder? Um, no, not that we know of. And, and I would say that if you're thinking about the difference in the age of onset, I, I think it's just an, an issue of, again, she, she knew that she had hearing loss earlier than that. And, and I've talked to the daughter um, in her college room, actually, and she can, she can actually speak to me without her hearing aids. So there's a mild to moderate hearing loss, but I don't feel that that's um, actually an issue with, with regard to the phenotype. All right. Well, uh, Cynthia, you've made Jim and all of us very proud. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jim.